everyone. Welcome to the Fielder Academy podcast. This is your host, Natalie Finazzo, COO and co-founder of Fielder. This is episode eight with a focus on leadership, ambition, and business staffing. So you can find us on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and YouTube, and you can also find us on social media at Join Fielder. So be sure to leave us a review and share us because we'd really appreciate that. So today we have our guest, Jeff Evans, who is a member of Fielder's Advisory Board. Jeff is the consummate business development professional and software business CEO who has spent the last 38 years growing, managing, starting, optimizing, and turning around businesses in the aerospace and aviation industry. To grow and expand businesses, Jeff deployed a methodology known as growth by intense customer knowledge. Applying this methodology has resulted in growing the businesses with which Jeff has been involved during his career by more than $22 billion. In 2018, Jeff retired with the Boeing, from Boeing Company after 28 years and has since opened his own consulting practice, Evans Enterprises, which has enabled him to have two main focuses. One, applying his skills and expertise to work with companies that have an intense and insatiable desire for business growth and operational optimization. And two, advising private equity firms on aerospace-related investments. So welcome to the podcast, Jeff. We're so excited for you to be here. Thank you, Natalie. I'm happy to be here. So today we're going to talk about... Um, a lot of your experience um, as a leader, and we know that you've had extensive staffing experience at a corporation as large as Boeing. Um, what do you think it takes to become an effective leader? Well, I think that it's really important uh, for an effective leader to, first of all, particularly young in their career, to develop uh, deep subject matter expertise in the area of the business that they find themselves, whether it's finance or procurement or but for me, sales and business development, it's important to really understand how your function operates and, uh, and also to ensure that uh, you know the relationship between the part of the business that you happen to work in and the rest of the business. Because no business operates as a single function. There are multiple functions, HR, finance, if it's a manufacturing business, production, manufacturing, shipping, logistics, understand where you are, get a deep subject matter expertise in that area so that you can utilize that as you attempt to try to expand in your career. I think the other thing is that uh, when you talk about leadership, uh, you don't have leaders without followers. I used to tell my team all the time, you call me the leader, but let's face it, uh, that's kind of counter to human intuition. The example I would always give is if the fire alarm went off in the building, uh, your human instinct would take over and you run for the door. You wouldn't say, hey, where's Jeff? You know, so leadership is an earned thing. And to earn it, you need to enable the success of other people, to have them want to trust in following you. So you can do that even before you become a quote unquote official leader. You can do that by enabling the success of the teammates that you you've, uh, work with in, in the organization that you're in. And lastly, uh, I think it's really important, and I didn't really grasp this early in my career, but it's really important to cultivate a mentor network, both in the space that you're operating and outside the space you're operating. Because you, know, you come out of school and you sort of have this mindset of, I've got to do well, I've got to beat the test. It's a, it's a single meritorious kind of a focus. When you get into the business world, nobody does anything alone. And it's very, very important for you to make sure that you are cultivating mentorship, both from the standpoint of giving you guidance based upon having had some experiences that maybe you're facing, and also giving you perspective as you start to think about the kinds of things that you want to do to be successful in whatever part of the business you're working in. Enable people or allow people to give you perspective so that you can kind of check whether or not your, your path is maybe the right path, or maybe they've seen something along the way that might say, hey, that path might not be the right one for you. Right, exactly. I can agree with that for sure you know as like a young professional I I mean I look up to my mentors and advisors and you know they've been through it before so you that's how you learn so yep, exactly exactly what do you what qualities do you actually look for um 
in young professionals who are bound for success in a company? Like anything specific you see while hiring, like while you have hired them? Well, you know, before we all became young professionals, we were young people and we learned about things in life uh, even before we went to that first interview. What I look for, even without someone, or someone who hasn't really had any quote unquote experience, I look for an insatiable learner. Someone who has demonstrated through the things they found of interest in their lives at, up to that point, um, demonstrated a willingness to go learn more about it, understand how it works and where it works and who values it and those kinds of things. Uh, you can never ever go wrong being a lifetime or insatiable learner because there's always more to learn. And even though we sometimes get to a point where we think, yeah, I got it. Well, maybe you do, maybe you don't. Or did you think about this aspect of it? So even again, before uh, official experience has been garnered by young people, I, I want to understand what they've been passionate about. What have you, what have you done about it? What'd you, what'd you, you know, how'd you get into it? What have you learned about it since then? Where do you think it's going next? That gives you insight into a trait that says that they're, just, they're not going to become stagnant people. They're going to get into the business and really try to grow their knowledge and in doing so grow the business. Uh, the other thing that uh, I always try to look for is examples of, of having gone the extra mile. You know, we've all gotten tasks along our journey that um, sometimes were difficult, sometimes not the most pleasant tasks that we wanted. And we were kind of thinking in the back of our mind, geez, I can't wait for this to be over. And so you get to some modicum of, of completion and you want to check the box, done. Well candidly, there may be more to the story. So the willingness to go the extra mile to find out more about it, to determine whether or not whatever you delivered or, or worked on met the expectations of whoever you're giving it to, in most cases for me, the customer, uh, go the extra mile so that you get a full context of the, the, the opportunities and the tasks that come before you. Uh, and again, if I see that or examples of that, it doesn't have to be in a job related environment, but somebody was working on a paper or working on uh, a project or doing something in their community. Uh, that trait of going the extra mile sends me a very positive signal that that individual will carry that with them as they go forward in their career. And again, I can't emphasize enough um, the comfort at a certain point in time. And when, when I've had inter, uh, interviews with uh, potential interns, uh, I always want to pull on, tell me some examples of when you worked well in a team. Um, what was the team's objective? What was your role? And again, that's trying to get at uh, this mindset of, I realize I'm not the only one here. I'm not the one who's gonna necessarily make it done, make, make it happen. And that team orientation will carry you throughout your life. And if you're starting your career, uh, even before you start your quote unquote official career, make sure that you uh, have experience working in a, in a team environment and, and uh, collaborating and sharing, all those kinds of, of, of uh, capabilities and traits will, will serve you well as you try to advance in your career. Right. I, I definitely agree with, agree with that. And I, I really liked how you pointed out how it's, it, teamwork is super important. And I think that when, even when I was interviewing for my job, that they wanted to know how you were able to work in a team because you aren't going to be doing everything alone. You're going to be building on each other's skills. And as a college student, a lot of them are going to be interviewing um, soon for those internships and um, maybe during the summer, maybe during the fall. Do you have any advice for them right now? Well, you know, I'll tell you the most uh, impressive interviews I've had with college students uh, in my career. And as I've advised mentees of mine after having these experiences, stemmed around a couple of things. One is, and students are very familiar with this, do your homework, do it in advance. Understand the company that you're going to uh, have this interview with and do the research. I mean, young people, we, all people have no excuse anymore about, about research. It's just a matter of time. The resources are there. Uh, that's why they, that's why the internet exists. Uh, but understand, you know, what the company is all about. What are their products? Uh, what are their uh, customers? Who are some of their customers, main customers? What are their challenges? Who's their competition? And all of those kinds of things are to prepare you for a dialogue in the interview, not just a question and answer session. Because the reality is that in any interview, what you're seeking to do is to distinguish yourself from the competition. Because there was somebody before you and there'll be somebody after you. And the question becomes whether that interview person or panel 
is going to remember Natalie. And if Natalie showed up with a, an insight into the company, asking for provocative questions, again, that sends that signal. That this young lady is very proactive, very prepared, and the kind of person that I want on the team, because those are the very kinds of inquisitive uh, efforts we'll have to make as we are taking on the challenge of, of whatever the, the, uh, the company or the job is. So you, that homework is something you can do without cost. And it doesn't have to be perfectly right. It just needs to send that signal that you thought about this more than just a job opportunity. You're thinking about it from the perspective of what the company is all about. I think the other thing is uh, really ask questions about the company's near-term goals. Because you know, every company has uh, goals. You're, not, you're in business to make money, or you're in business if you're a nonprofit to achieve a mission, or whatever the case may be. But um, again, part of your homework should give some kind of top level strategic mission statements and blah, blah, blah. But what you want to do is to uh, ask as you're going through the interview process, um, what are the near term goals? What are the, the things that you, Mr. Interviewer, Ms. Mrs. Interviewer, uh, are worried about? What are the kinds of things that keep you up at night? Those are the, the questions that, again, send that, send that signal is this person didn't just show up here to get a paycheck. They're really trying to get in here and help us because that's what you really want from your team. You wanna have folks who are gonna show up and, and be ready to play when, when, the, when the opportunity presents itself. And again, asking that interviewer from their perspective, because you'll get a chance in the interview to have some back and forth dialogue. Mm -hmm. uh, genuinely, not, not in a sort of rote fashion, but genu genuinely. Uh, Mrs. Jones, what are the kind of things that keep you up at night? I know you're running a very important part of the business. There must be things that are worrisome for you. Can you share those? And nine times out of 10, be prepared because they'll come out with it. Not that you can solve it all, but it gives you insight into the kinds of things that matter to them in that particular job. Right, I like that a lot. I think that, um, that those types of questions will really help you stand out um, and especially preparing yourself about knowing about the company too. I remember a few years ago when I've interviewed for, um, I interviewed for some company and um, I didn't actually prepare my knowledge on like the company background. And I remember being asked a question um, about the company and I had no idea. And I, you know, I was really embarrassed, but it just made me prepare for the next interview and know that I had to really, really like do some, some research beforehand. And, and I think, you know, in, in, in interviews after that, I was able to pull out some questions that um, showed that I knew, I knew a lot more about the company. I think one company was going through a merger and they didn't tell me before, but I, I did my research and I think they were impressed and that really stood out to them. Yeah. And the reality is that the interviewer kind of expects that you at least did some research. Because if you haven't, then it begs the question, why are you here? You just want a paycheck? Uh, you know, I've got five other people I've interviewed already that want a paycheck, so I was looking for something distinctive. Yeah. So uh, there's no substitute for, for doing that homework. For sure, for sure. Now from a hiring perspective, what information is helpful for you when you um, are deciding to invest in an intern for an internship? Well, you know, I, I believe that that the talent on the team, as I said earlier, is what makes the team. And if you are not careful and diligent about your selection, it can open up a lot of channels of, of uh, things you don't want to do. You have to get rid of people or things aren't working out or whatever the case may be. So I think there's nothing uh, more important than investing the time um, as, a, as a hiring manager and understanding, first of all, the interests of the candidate. You know, what are the kinds of things you're interested in? And I want to know what they're interested in because to the extent that I have opportunities and the assignments that I give them to, to um, enable that interest to, to be enriched, I, I'd like to do that. Uh, so I'm, in, I'm curious about their interests. Uh, secondly, I'm uh, very curious about what they believe to be their strengths. And I, I, I would encourage your, the, the listeners here today to not come in claiming strengths in areas that you don't have strengths because you're at a point in your career where you're not expected to have a lot of experience, but there are traits that you have there. Like if, you have, if you're a prolific researcher, you know, you've had opportunities to do, to do, that, do that in school. So tell me like research, uh, whatever the strengths are, but don't have them be, you know, a list of 20, you know, just the things that you feel very confident that you can deliver on. And I, I like to know that because 
that gives me the opportunity to know where I can challenge them. You know, if Natalie's a pr prolific researcher, you know, I'm, I'm trying to sell an airplane service to an airline competing with five other, other firms. Well, Natalie, I like, once you come on board, I'd like for you to go and do some research on these other five firms and understand where their strengths and weaknesses are. What are customers saying about them? Now, if you've told me you're a prolific researcher and I give you that assignment and you go, uh, where do I start? It's like, well, I'm not sure that you're a prolific researcher. So it's important to really be candid and honest about your strengths. But likewise, um, I'd like to know what the perceived weaknesses are. And we all have them. And I know that sometimes that is uh, thought to be a scary question because people kind of get caught up in if I say I have none, then that will imply I'm perfect. If I say I have one that might be critical to this job, that, may, that means I may not get the job. Don't, just be honest. Just be honest and candid about where you believe your perceived weaknesses are and where you think that there are areas that you can work on to improve. And the reason I like to know that is that I view the internship as an opportunity for experience and improvement. So if I know where your weaknesses are, two things, I won't assign you task alone in that area because I know that you've already told me that's a struggle for me. But the other thing is that I will ensure that either I put around you other experienced teammates or, and, and not just or, and, I, as the hiring manager, will make sure that I'm checking in and having some extra time with you as you get involved in some of these areas that may be perceived weaknesses for you so that you know that you've got support, you know you've got somebody you can lean on, you can ask questions, there is no dumb question. And the objective of that is to come out of that experience with you being stronger in that area that you came into it being weak. So it's important to be candid, it's important to be straightforward, and I, as a hiring manager, want to know those three things, strengths, weaknesses, and interests, because I want to, I want to put those into the, the, the development plan, if you will, for you as you are in the organization for the period of time of your, of your internship. I really like how you pointed out how the internship is where the student is still learning and those weaknesses are something they can strengthen because I think a lot of students get worried that they have to know everything um, when they first start that internship, but that is where they are going to be trained and learn more about the specific field that they're entering in. So. Right, right. I mean, just think about it as most of us are aware of kind of interns in the medical profession. We've seen television shows where you know, Joe Blow's an intern. Well, if you've got a health condition, um, you want the intern standing by the doctor so that you're he or she is learning so that if that health condition trans transforms into or, or transcends into your next generation and five years later that intern is showing up, they've got the experience. You don't want the intern working on you because it's an intern. They're, they're in the learning mode. And that's what people expect. And again, as you go into internships, don't overthink it. Don't think you need to be perfect. Don't think you need to be the subject matter expert because you aren't and if you think it you'll be the only one in the room thinking it because everybody knows that you're not that person yeah. so take it take advantage of the experience for what it is and that is a learning experience yeah so what do you think about um you know when i've read a lot about how um when you talk about your weaknesses you kind of turn it into like a positive what do you think mm -hmm. about like that take on like when you're interviewing well i, I think that you can try to turn something into a positive, uh, but a weakness today for me is a weakness. Right. And I, can, I can't turn it into a positive in an interview with you. I can tell you uh, situations where I saw that weakness not be helpful to me, or that weakness caused me to be uh, tentative about approaching something. I can give you context about the weakness, but I can't really turn it into a positive. And again, all of that is just humility. It's owning that you're not perfect, and it's realizing that the uh, experience that you're applying for is one to help you be better. And yeah, you may get a hiring manager occasionally that might furl his or her brow at a weakness, but the reality, and if you ever get that, don't be bashful about asking the question. Is that weakness that I just expressed a, a problem? I mean, I'm a 20 year old college student and uh, I really thought this company that I'm interviewing with would be an area that would appreciate my acknowledging my weakness and would work with me to help strengthen it. More often than not, uh, that hiring person is going to sit back in their chair and go, geez, what kind of look did I give this person to make them think I was? So, you know, and not that you want to be in a, in a game back and forth with them. But my point is, don't be afraid to share where you need development because the internship is, in fact, just that, a development opportunity.
Right. Yeah. I like that. I like that being honest about your weaknesses. So let's talk about when someone um, first lands their first job, what are your mm -hmm. best tips for them to excel in their career and follow a path towards leadership? What, maybe that's um, certain skills they can um, attain, training, education they can start. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, it kind of depends on the nature of their role. Uh, but I think that if you start a role before graduate school, which candidly I recommend, because you get, if you go to, through undergrad and you jump right into graduate school, you really don't have any context. You got cases that you're reading that other people did and you're asked to weigh in on how did company X perform on that case. But when you've gotten a little bit of experience under your belt, going to work right out of, out of undergrad and work three or four years or two or three years or some period of time so you have some contextual experience, I find that the grad school um, scenario is much more enriching and candidly I've taught students in grad school that it was clear uh, who the, the folks are that had absolutely no experience and those who had contextual experience that could bring enlightenment to the conversation. So I'm not saying that education and advanced education is not important. I think it is. I think that you can get more out of it if you've had the opportunity to have a little bit of uh, experience under your belt. That being said, if you're going into a company for the first time, the advice that I give every young person, every person, not just young person, every person that I've ever hired is spend quality and focused time up front in the first 90 days, understanding what I call the levers that drive the business. Every business has a desire to make money, but there are ways that you make money. If you're a manufacturing facility, then you've got a production line, you've got a supply chain, you've got you know, things that are key to your being able to generate that revenue. If you're a services outfit that doesn't manufacture, then you've got talent, certain types of talent in terms of uh, various areas of subject matter expertise, but whatever it is, try to understand how do we make money here? What, what's, the, what's, the, 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 what's the connection between this department and that department? And not that you would do that kind of independent of anybody else. You're new to the job. You're in that period where people expect you to ask questions. So ask questions. Ask questions about the customers. Because if you've done your homework coming in, you know some of the customers. You know some of the competition. But once you get in, then you're positioned to really kind of gain intel from the inside. And get as, as great an understanding as you can about all the key levers that drive the business. And then share that with your boss or with others to get their perspective because A, you're not gonna be right from the first time out of the block. And it will also start sending a signal to the people who are around you who will be very instrumental in whether or not you grow in terms of le level and at what rate you grow. It will send that signal early that Natalie's really, really trying to figure out how to make a, con a contribution as early as possible. So really understand the key drivers that help the business to make money. And then whatever department you're in, uh, there's something called KPIs or, or um, key performance indicators. Your performance uh, or the performance of your department depends on delivery of certain types of outcomes. If you are an HR department, your outcomes are different than a procurement department or than a finance department. Whatever department you're in, understand the KPIs for that department so that you are clear about what success means or how success is defined in the environment in which you're working. And once you have that understanding, then determine where you are and your role in the department as it relates to delivering on those KPIs. If you're, the, if you're in HR, if you're in recruiting, your part is not in benefits or hiring, it's in recruiting. And so then there are a certain number of, of applicants that need to be assembled to get to the hiring manager, and your measure is going to be quality applicants delivered to the hiring manager. So that becomes your part, your KPI in the overall organization of, uh, of HR. So understand where you play, understand what success uh, uh, is, how success is defined in terms of the KPI, and really understand how the HR department in this case factors in the overall scheme of success for the company. So the levers, the KPIs, and where do you fit?
a lot of people when they first start their job, they don't, they're afraid to ask questions, but that's only going to help them, you know, sure. learn everything, learn in the key performance um, indicators, those two. I think a lot of people forget about that. And that is going to show your manager that you are, you really want to know how everything works. You're in it for like the long haul. So for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And right. again, can't, can't emphasize enough. You're just starting, whether you're 20 or 40. Uh, if you're just starting at a company, no one expects you to know it all. Everyone expects you to ask questions. Now, if you wait a year and you start asking questions, then the question becomes, well, where have you been? Yeah. I thought you knew what was going on. So ask, ask a lot and ask early. All right. So any other final words of encouragement for young professionals or anyone starting a new um, career right now, um, especially with um, the, all the chaos going on? Yeah, these are unprecedented times. Uh, you know, I, I was going to say challenging, but this is way past challenging, particularly if you are in the early stage of your career uh, where you haven't gotten a job yet or you're just getting out of school. Or candidly, if you have found yourself among the 30 million people that are unemployed in this country as a result of this pandemic. So there's nothing that I can think of that is um, that has a, a precedence. Um, you know, I was in the airplane business for a long time. And yes, we saw some downturns uh, post 9-11. Uh, there was a downturn in aircraft traffic or airline traffic, which had a ripple effect through the supply chain. I worked for a manufacturer, so we weren't making as many airplanes and all that sort of ripple effect. Uh, but we bounced back from that. Uh, once there was a a belief in the, in the flying public that security had been established enough that the likelihood of something like that occurring was pretty diminished and thank God it, it, it has it. Um, and then uh, I certainly lived through and came out on the other side of the 2008, 2009 financial crisis. Again, uh, dramatic impact across the, the aviation space and a lot of other spaces. Um, traffic, which is how revenue gets generated, people fly, that goes down it has a cascading effect back into the supply chain. This is different in a lot of ways. It's different in that there are, uh, there's no industry on the planet that can say that it's un unaffected. There's no country or region on the planet that hasn't, that isn't spared coronavirus. So the return, if you will, as we return to normal after 9-11, as we return to normal after um, uh, the 2008-2009 crisis, the return is going to be phased. It's going to be different for you know, my former industry versus yours versus somebody else's. Mm -hmm. If you're in the, in the um, supply chain arena with lots of product like Amazon, you're, you're fortunate that you're not nearly as impacted, but even Amazon's having impacts. Yeah. So my point is that um, this is unprecedented. There is no remedy that anyone can say, well, you know, just pull uh, this plan out of the box and apply it. So I would say to those that are uh, aspiring to, to capture a new opportunity, realize that uh, it's going to take some time. It's, don't, don't get discouraged. Uh, when I was a kid, I used to still do, I used to like to fish a lot. And I can recall going out with my dad and you know, thinking the first cast, eat a fish. And after like the 10th cast and no fish, I'm like, I'm ready to go home. You know, um, that's, don't, don't take that attitude. Uh, if you, I mean, even before all of this, you probably had to apply eight, nine, 10, 12 times before you got a bite um, or a call. Imagine that being, and, and plan on that being 10 times that. Because for every time you're applying for something, that very company is dealing with having probably let someone go, uh, being just trying to determine, you know, what, how they come back. Do they come back as full-time employees? Or are they contingent labor or contract employees? So there are a lot of dynamics going on. So Again, I encourage you to uh, really, really be aware of the, the, the dynamics and don't let your, whatever your expectation was of how many times I've got to try before I get a, a hit, change that. You know, just change it. And, and more, most importantly, do not, do not get discouraged. Do not give, it's not you. It's not because of anything that you did. It's the environment that we, that we live in. And uh, uh, there's, a, there's a book called Emotional Resilience. Get your emotional resilience up and ready so that you can continue to focus on what it is that you're after and that is your next opportunity. Um, and again, the, I emphasized earlier about doing homework. Um, 
depending upon what your skills and interests are, as I said earlier, not every, or, not every uh, industry is going to return at the same rate or in the same phase. So do your homework. Where are your skills and interests applicable? Maybe it's not aviation, which has got its own path to come back. Maybe it's, you know, retail, I mean, whatever it is, do your homework and have that homework help to guide where your pursuits are. Because you certainly would want to uh, focus in areas that are more than likely and sooner rather than later returning to you know, 19, uh, 2019 sort of levels. So it's like back to the fishing analogy. I mean, I could fish in the ocean, uh, which is huge, a lot of water, but geez, where are the fish? Or I could fish in a small pond that I know just got stocked with 50,000 trout two days ago. Well, I'll probably fish in the small pond because I'd like to eat. And so, you know, chances are I'll catch a fish. So that homework on the, on the, the industries, the companies, um, in the in the wake of what we've got going on, it's important because it will it will uh, focus you in terms of I know I'm fishing in the right pond here, and I can increase my likelihood of getting it getting an opportunity. And um, lastly, I would say when you do get that opportunity, know that if you're fortunate enough to get the opportunity for the interview, there's a large number of people who are just as fortunate and they're psyched about the interview. Mm -hmm. So back to what I said earlier about doing your homework. Um, Distinguish yourself when you get in front of the interview panel. Come into that opportunity with as, I mean, as polished as you can be because your, your, your competition pool has expanded exponentially. And at the end of the day, it's still the one or two jobs. And so you've got you to be on your game even that much more to ensure that you're the one that gets selected. I think just from like having our college portal, um, just monitoring what's going on there and calling a lot of the businesses. We do realize that a lot of businesses are not hiring right now, but there are some who are. So like I said, it's so important to differentiate yourself so that you, if you are really, really need the position, you want them to know that you are the, the right person for the job. So. Exactly, exactly. And I guess one last thing I'd add, Natalie, um, the way in which talent is um, uh, utilized and captured by businesses is going to shift. Uh, we're, we're oriented toward the uh, apply for a job, get a job, become an employee. Mm -hmm. Well, with all of the work at home mandates that have been the product of this pandemic, companies are starting to realize that, wow, Natalie can work from home, be about as productive, and I don't have to maintain her office space yet. So companies are going to start doing a lot of different things. So the new normal is not going to be the old normal. So I say that to say this, um, expand your area of pursuit, not just companies. There are going to be a lot of opportunities in contract firms, firms that uh, companies will go to, to get somebody who does accounting or somebody who does uh, procurement, whatever, on some short-term basis. Now, granted, that doesn't come with the traditional benefits, but what it does come with is the opportunity to gain experience. Because uh, gaining experience, even at a contract firm, is probably in the long run a lot more valuable to you than just kind of sitting or by your computer with your fingers crossed. Mm -hmm. So uh, open your channel, you know, your, your field of view, expand your, your um, options, and um, focus on, yeah, getting a job, obviously, but if the job is not imminently available to you, look at contract firms that can put you to work, maybe with some less terms. And sometimes those terms, you know, don't include benefits, but sometimes the hourly wage is a little bit higher. Mm -hmm. So they're trade-offs, you know, in all places. But um, don't be bashful about kind of opening your aperture to, to look at opportunities maybe beyond where you uh, originally had uh, pre, pre-pandemic. Right. That's a great point to make because you might not get, if you're in engineering, you might not get that engineering position, but maybe there's something, um, maybe you have skills in a certain online, you know, platform that some sort of business is looking for um, that you can work remotely, then that's still valuable and you should still. Absolutely. Sure. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you so much, Jeff, for coming on. Um, the last thing we want you to do is share with our audience um, what is happening in the world of Jeff and um, where can our listeners find you? Okay. Happy to do it. What's happening in the world of Jeff? I didn't know there was a world of Jeff. <laughs> uh, well, since, since uh, retiring from Boeing in uh, 2018, I spent a lot of my time um, advising uh, private equity firms on the um, 
potential in, uh, uh, investments that they're contemplating in the aerospace arena. Um, I've enjoyed that. I've uh, expanded my own personal network uh, in doing that. But equally, uh, actually three things. Um, also, I really enjoy working with small and startup businesses as, uh, as I've gotten the opportunity with, with uh, Fielder. And uh, I found that I actually, I, I knew this, but I knew it in a larger context. Uh, some of the experience, a lot of the experience that I gained over my career is applicable and desired by businesses that candidly didn't have the resources of a big corporation. So they had to sort of, they, they're kind of stepping as they go without a lot of contextual background understanding. So I'm working with businesses that are focused on growing. It has candidly become quite the challenge. My um, phone has been ringing off the hook over the last um, three or four weeks because uh, growth is a function of expanding from where you are to something higher. Uh, I had the challenge of turning around a business at once in my career and kind of experienced kind of digging out of the hole. Uh, and even though we just got over the profitability level, that was growth for us because it, it took us from a place that we didn't want to be to a place that was comfortable, more comfortable. Likewise, in this environment, uh, a lot of companies are facing demise, candidly. And um, I try to work with them in uh, ways that are not going to... Uh, uh, totally add cost to their to the bottom line. I mean, I don't work for free, but the reality is that you know, there are a lot of ways that you can trade um, skills or, or future future gains or equity and future revenues and things of that sort. I try to be pretty creative in the ability to still deliver what I can bring to the table to help companies to either survive. And I think if you can survive this, you will, if you make the necessary adjustments that this environment has caused, you will grow on the other side of it. So uh, that's the second thing. And then thirdly, as I mentioned, the, uh, a lot of the volunteer work that I'm doing with um, our local university here, Florida Gulf Coast University, uh, mentoring and working with and or advising three or four startups. Um, the challenges there are, um, are many uh, because uh, the access to capital is really kind of on hold with all, all of what's going on. And a lot, and a lot of that role, I'm, I'm trying to uh, keep them encouraged. You know, you, you have a lot of fire. Uh, again, this situation, uh, people not calling you back or companies not you know, interested in talking about whatever you have to offer is not personal to the business. It's a function of the environment that we're in. So let's stay focused. Let's look at you know, honestly where, where we need to work, what challenges do we have you know, kind of coming into this, try to strengthen those while we're in this kind of down mode and uh, come out of it on the other side with positiveness. So um, I enjoy doing those things. Um, having retired gives me actually more opportunity to do it and uh it's been fun it's been fun i've, I've enjoyed it um a lot of the, the companies i'm working with found me on linkedin and um that's that's probably the easiest way and um uh, or my and i think my email address is, is there it's uh jeffrey evans at outlook.com it's g-e-o-f-f-r-e-y-e-v-a-n-s at outlook.com or you can look up evans enterprises on um on linkedin as well and you'll find me there Okay, great. Well, we'll definitely share um, those links in the comments at, at, for the podcast, but we um, really enjoyed having you on the podcast. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, I really admire um, you and all your knowledge that you're able to share with us. So, thank Natalie, you. it was a pleasure. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much for having me.